Chapter 19 of Abraham Lincoln, A History, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marianne. Abraham Lincoln, A History, Volume 4, by John Hay and John George Nicolay. Chapter 19, West Virginia. We have seen how in Maryland, Kentucky, and Missouri, the secession conspiracy was foiled by the resolute voice and energy of their loyal Union majorities. A like result in even a more marked degree occurred in the western part of the state of Virginia, and served to effect its permanent political division into two states. The broad area of Virginia, which before 1861 extended from Chesapeake Bay to the Ohio River, was bisected by the great natural barrier of the Allegheny Mountains, a fact which exerted a direct influence upon the period and character of her original exploration and settlement. Her seaboard and the adjacent plains and plateau sloping up to the crests of the great mountain chain, comprising the fairest and most fertile portions of her lands, naturally gathered the first and principal harvest of immigration and wealth. Here the profitable tobacco culture found its productive fields, whilst coastwise and foreign commerce made its home in her numerous bays and rivers. Eastern Virginia was already the great parent colony of the South, when the western portions of the state were only a vaguely known wilderness. Even the first streams of western emigration passed over or around it, to Kentucky to the south, or to Ohio on the north of the beautiful river. The reason is plain. Western Virginia was a succession of mountain ridges and a medley of hills, and the adventurous pioneer pushed on towards the more inviting levels of forest or prairie which lay beyond. Nevertheless, being a diversified, picturesque, healthful region, a country of pure air, clear springs, magnificent forests, lovely valleys, it gradually gathered a population of hunters and explorers, of lumbermen and miners, of herdsmen and small farmers, pursuing a local and miscellaneous, rather than a staple agriculture, and began to lay the foundation for a great future manufacturing industry, of which the basis was found in the immense resources of its forests and mines. The Tidewater region of Virginia not only accumulated preponderant population and wealth, but also, as a direct consequence, absorbed and exercised controlling political power. Here the structure of society had been reared on the English model, with great estates, manor houses, aristocratic habits, and pride of family. Here traditions yet lingered fondly about the colonial and revolutionary periods as the days of greatest prosperity and influence. The local magnates, who made Richmond their mecca, laid and expended taxes as though the Blue Ridge were the true western boundary of the Old Dominion, and the great mountain region beyond only a tributary province. It is possible that necessity as well as pride may to some extent have prompted this absorption. Many of the once fertile tobacco fields of eastern Virginia were exhausted and abandoned long before the valuable grass and pasture lands of western Virginia were cleared of their heavy forests. Western Virginia could do nothing but complain. With a double population to do with the voting, all the large appropriations and favors of the state government steadily flowed to eastern Virginia. The greatest contrast was visible in the institution of slavery. Eastern Virginia had a population of 472,494 slaves, Western Virginia only 18,371 slaves. Since slave population was everywhere the measure of disunion feeling, there was comparatively little disloyalty in Western Virginia. Scattering individuals here and there were poisoned by the desire of succession, but the bulk of the people remained unshaken in their attachment to the Union. When, therefore, the Richmond Convention, by the secret secession ordinance on the 17th of April, and a few days later by a military league with Jefferson Davis, transferred Virginia to the rebel government at Montgomery, the western half of the state rose against the rude violation of self-government with an almost unanimous protest and resolved to succeed from succession. A series of popular meetings was held, with such success that on the 13th of May, delegates from 25 counties met for consultation at Wheeling, and agreed on such further action and cooperation as would enable them to escape the treason and alienation to which they had been committed without their consent. 
the leaders made their designs known to president lincoln at washington and to general mcclellan at cincinnati and were assured of earnest sympathy and promised active help from the ohio contingent of three months volunteers whenever the decisive moment of need should arise notwithstanding the unmistakable signs of disaffection governor letcher issued his proclamations and calls for state militia in western virginia as in other parts and sent officers there to collect and organize it these however soon returned discouraging reports that feeling was very bitter that union organizations existed in most of the counties that that section of the state was verging on actual rebellion the confederate recruiting officers made so little headway that a few companies were sent from eastern virginia to beverly as a nucleus around which to gather sufficient force to control the western end of the baltimore and ohio railroad but the counter-revolution was more aggressive than succession under call from the union men general mcclellan on may twenty sixth ordered a movement of four regiments by the branch railroads from wheeling and from parkersburg to form a junction at grafton their advance was slow owing to the necessity of repairing railroad bridges which the enemy had burned and the rebel commander colonel g a porterfield found plenty of time to retire with his small force to philippi a village in the secluded mountain valley about fifteen miles south of grafton here he hoped to make a lodgment from which he could return and obstruct or harass the railroad but the union leaders left him no time for offense the west virginians themselves had formed a regiment for the government under colonel b f kelly who with a thorough local knowledge of the roads and country projected and led a successful night march against porterfield on the morning of june third while the rebel officers were awaiting the abatement of a rainstorm to begin a retreat the union forces arriving by different routes suddenly appeared on opposite hills commanding the town and porterfield's camp attacked in complete surprise was dispersed in an unceremonious rout under shelter and encouragement of this initial military success the political scheme of forming a new state proceeded with accelerated ardor as early as june eleventh a delegate convention representing about forty counties lying between the crest of the alleghanies and the ohio river met and organized at wheeling on the thirteenth of june after reciting the various treasonable usurpations of the richmond convention and governor letcher it adopted a formal declaration that all the acts of the convention and executive were without authority and void and declared vacated all executive legislative and judicial offices in the state held by those who adhere to said convention and executive on the nineteenth of june an ordinance was adopted creating a provisional state government under which francis h pierpoint was appointed governor to wield executive authority in conjunction with an executive council of five members a legislature was constituted by calling together such members elect as would take a prescribed oath of allegiance to the united states and to the restored government of virginia and providing for filling the vacancies of those who refused a similar provision continued or substituted other state and county officers after adding sundry other ordinances to this groundwork of restoration the convention on the twenty fifth took a recess until august the newly constituted legislature soon met to enact laws for the provisional government and on july ninth it elected two united states senators who were admitted to seats four days later so far the work was simply a repudiation of succession and a restoration of the usurped government of the whole state but the main motive and purpose of the counter-revolution was not allowed to halt or fail in august the wheeling convention reassembled and on the twentieth adopted an ordinance creating the new state of kanawha and providing for a popular vote to be taken in the following october on the question of ratification in due time governor pierpoint organized his provisional government at wheeling and on june twenty first made formal application under the constitution of the united states for aid from the general government to suppress rebellion and protect the people against domestic violence secretary cameron responded for the president that a large additional military force would soon be sent and devolved the further organization of the west virginia troops upon the new governor who soon had four regiments in the field the richmond authorities sought as quickly as possible to repair the philippi disaster they sent ex-governor henry a wise with the commission of a brigadier general to the kanawha valley while the more experienced general robert s garnett 
who had been a major in the United States Army, was charged with the duty of gathering up the debris of Porterfield's command and making headway against the Union advance along the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad. Lee, from his headquarters at Richmond, was anxious to break permanently this great line of communication between Washington and the West, and a special expedition had been devised some weeks before to operate against the important bridges and tunnels about the Cheat River. The long turnpike through the Alleghanies from Staunton to the Ohio branches at Beverly in the Cheat River Valley, one line going to Buckhannon through a pass over Rich Mountain, the other going to Philippi through a pass in the same range 17 miles further north, which is there named Laurel Hill. Supplied with partial reinforcements, Garnett fortified these two passes, which he reported were the gates to the northwestern country. Arriving near the end of June, he soon had Lieutenant Colonel John Pegram established in the pass at Rich Mountain with a regiment and six guns, while he himself held the pass at Laurel Hill with three or four regiments, leaving a slight detachment behind them at Beverly. He frankly reported to Richmond that his circumstances were discouraging. His men were in a miserable condition as to clothing, arms, and equipments, but a still greater obstacle was the prevalence of an opposing public sentiment. The Union men, he wrote, are greatly in the ascendancy here, and are much more zealous and active in their cause than the secessionists. The enemy are kept fully advised of our movements, even to the strength of our scouts and pickets, by the country people, while we are compelled to grope in the dark as much as if we were invading a foreign and hostile country. Even had the surrounding conditions been better, the force which had been given to Garnett was altogether inadequate to his task. Early in July, McClellan went in person to West Virginia, and having a greatly superior army, resolved on an offensive campaign. He sent Brigadier General T.A. Morris, with five or six regiments to Philippi, to confront Garnett at Laurel Hill, and threaten a main attack, while he himself moved with seven regiments to Buckhannon, intending to turn the enemy's position on Rich Mountain. Pushing forward to Roaring Creek, he found Pegram's camp near the west base of the mountain and so strongly entrenched in defile that McClellan hesitated to make a direct attack in front, even with numerical superiority of seven to one. On the same day on which this information of Pegram's position was obtained through a reconnaissance, Brigadier General W. S. Rosecrans, commanding under McClellan, heard by accident that a young countryman, a well-informed neighborhood guide, was in his camp. He was forthwith brought to headquarters and interrogated by the general. He proved to be the son of a farmer named Hart, living on the turnpike on top of Rich Mountain, some two miles in rear of Pegram's camp. He had hunted and driven cattle about the woods and through the mountains and valleys of the vicinity all his boyhood, and knew the secret of every footpath and byway. He consented to act as guide to a flanking expedition, and Rosecrans immediately gave preliminary orders for preparation. The general then laid his plan before McClellan, that he would endeavor to reach Hart's farm by a circuitous route, and returning by way of a turnpike, would attack the rear of Pegram's entrenchments, while McClellan should attack in front. After some hesitation, McClellan consented, and Rosecrans started on his march at daylight of July 11th. His route lay south of the turnpike, and his approach was not suspected, because Pegram looked for a similar attempt north of it, and had given all his attention to intercept it in that direction. A rainstorm, lasting all the forenoon, also greatly favored the hidden march. By noon, climbing through ravines and thickets, his column was near the crest, but here his skirmishers were fired upon, and it was found that a rebel detachment of three hundred men with two guns had been sent back to guard the road, and had reached Hart's farm a little in advance, planted their guns, and hurriedly raised some slight defenses. Rosecrans, as soon as possible, placed his men in position to attack. We formed at about three o'clock, says his report, under cover of our skirmishers, guarding well against a flank attack from the direction of the rebels' position, and after a brisk fire, which threw the rebels into confusion, carried their position by a charge, driving them from behind some log breastworks, and pursuing them into the thickets on the mountain. We captured twenty-one prisoners, two brass six-pounders, fifty stands of arms, and some corn and provisions. Our loss was twelve killed and forty-nine wounded. McClellan had moved up his forces and waited for the signal to attack Pegram's camp in front, but the expected message did not come. 
the cavalry sergeant sent by rosecrans to carry it encountered a rebel picket and was wounded and captured when the fight was over the day was already so far spent that the wearied volunteers went into bouviac on the battlefield pegram heard the firing and started with another detachment to reinforce his rear guard but only arrived at the moment of its defeat and dispersion finding himself thus caught between hostile forces he returned and that night made an effort to escape by abandoning his camp and marching northward along the mountain to join garnett at laurel hill on the following day july twelfth mcclellan received news of the fight and of the flight of pegram marching forward he not only possessed himself of pegram's camp with its abandoned equipage and its four spiked guns but pushed entirely over the mountain and occupied beverly that night he was further agreeably surprised by receiving a proposal from pegram to surrender his remnant of six hundred men and officers with whom he had found it impossible to escape garnett already threatened at laurel hill by morris probably heard of pegram's disaster and started to retreat towards beverly but reaching leedsville on the afternoon of the twelfth he learned that mcclellan was already there this forced him to take the only other route open to him a rough and difficult mountain road northward by way of st george and west union in this attempt his command of thirty three hundred men and cumbrous train became very much scattered and disorganized morris hurried forward an advanced column of three union regiments in pursuit led by captain h w benham of the engineers who came up with the rebel wagon train at carrick's ford one of the crossings of the cheat river twenty six miles northwest of laurel hill about noon of july thirteenth garnett was here in person looking after his retreat he faced about his rear guard a single regiment and planted three guns to command the road in order to defend the ford the effort however afforded him no relief the union regiments advanced gallantly to the attack one of them handsomely turning the position upon which the rebel line broke and fled abandoning one of its guns retreat and pursuit were continued to the next ford perhaps a quarter of a mile further on where garnett was killed in a dulcetory skirmish fire between sharpshooters the union forces captured the wagon train one gun two stands of colors and fifty prisoners but occupied with their trophies they abandoned the chase and the bulk of garnett's command made good its escape through the mountains it would be a great mistake to estimate this campaign in western virginia merely by the numbers engaged or the enemy overcome as compared with the great campaigns and battles of the following year rich mountain and carrick's ford shrink to the dimensions of ordinary skirmishes but these two petty union victories came to the longing hope of the north hitherto vexed by delay and disappointment as a great joy beyond their moral effects they were attended by important and permanent political and military results rebellion never afterwards secured a foothold in upper west virginia and in the kanawha valley the enemy was with fluctuating movements maneuvered out of position and out of the country during the remainder of the year thus the military frontier was definitely forced back and the political transformation of the state begun by the wheeling convention went on unchecked until in june 1863 west virginia was formally admitted to the union as a separate and sovereign state one of the most marked results of the campaign was upon the personal fortunes of mcclellan he had planned for himself a broad and brilliant movement and entered upon it with abundant means and full confidence of success have directed movement in force up the great kanawha he telegraphed to washington on july sixth and other movements of troops covering nearly the whole of western virginia by the eighth or ninth at latest i expect to occupy beverly fighting a battle in the meanwhile i propose to drive the enemy over the mountains toward staunton and expect your further orders by telegraph whether to move on to staunton on the south or towards wytheville not only sanguine about his present undertakings he was already reaching forward to secure more extended tasks and responsibilities for the future newspaper reports he telegraphed the following day say that my department is to be broken up i hope the general will leave under my control both the operations on the mississippi and in western virginia if he cannot do so the indiana and ohio troops are necessary to my success with these at my disposal and such resources as i command in virginia if the government will give me ten thousand arms for distribution in eastern tennessee i think i can break the backbone of succession please instruct whether to move on to staunton or on to wytheville 
General Scott cautioned him against his Staunton or Wytheville project as making his line dangerously long. But he watched his progress with eager interest and sent him frequent words of encouragement. The General-in-Chief, and what is more, the Cabinet, including the President, are charmed with your activity, valor, and consequent successes of Rich Mountain, the 11th, and of Beverly this morning. We do not doubt that you will in due time sweep the rebels from western Virginia, but we do not mean to precipitate you as you are fast enough. Even while this telegram was going to him, the additional success at Carrick's Ford was being gained. When, therefore, on the following day, McClellan summed up in a single laconic dispatch the scattered and disconnected incidents of three different days happening forty miles apart, the impression, without design on his part, was most naturally produced on the authorities and on the country that so sweeping and effective a campaign could only be the work of a military genius of the first order. McClellan was the unquestioned hero of the hour. The eclat of this achievement soon called him to Washington, and in the train of events which followed had no insignificant influence in securing his promotion on the 1st of November following, without further victories, to the command of all the armies of the United States. End of chapter 19